Ooh, I'm, I'm twice on the panel. There we go. Okay. Mr. Stewart, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay. And uh, Mr. Gordon, you said you're ready to go. Yes. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, council workshop for Monday, September 27th to be held at five o'clock. Uh, this is a, a hybrid meeting. So we have both uh, members of the public and uh, council and staff participating in person as well as online. This is sort of the new format that we're going to try for the next while. We found that a lot of people really enjoyed participating in the meetings virtually. It makes it easier for people to uh, to uh, carry on both their, their personal lives and then hop onto a meeting for the particular interest that they're interested in, as well as people uh, wanting to come in and get to, uh, the riveting in-person experience that we offer right here at the council chamber. So. I want to welcome everybody here to tonight's meeting, both virtually and in person. Uh, at this point, Council, we have an agenda that's been circulated. Are there any errors or omissions from the agenda as presented? Okay, hearing and seeing none, I'm going to call the question on the uh, uh, on adoption of the agenda, moved by Councillor Murray. Is there a seconder on the uh, adoption of the agenda? I saw Councillor Back's hand. Okay, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded, motion carries and the agenda is adopted. Now for tonight's meeting, uh, uh, this meeting has been called, uh, oh, actually we do have minutes that have been circulated as well, sorry about that. Uh, we have two sets of minutes that have been presented and are in the uh, council package. These are for the June 14th council workshop and the July 12th council workshop. Are there any errors or omissions from those uh, minutes as presented? Hearing none, will a member of council please move adoption? I heard Councillor Murray. Is there a seconder on the matter? Councillor Hansen, call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries and the minutes are adopted. So the purpose of this meeting is uh, for one purpose only, and this is to hear the final report from the Rental, Social and Affordable Housing Task Force. Uh, over the last, uh, I think it was originally instituted, when would your first meeting date have been? August of 2019. Uh, this has been a very long process. We we're obviously interrupted by COVID uh, in, in great degree, but also uh, additional matters were, were returned back to the Rental and Affordable Housing Task Force. They were originally set up for uh, a much shorter uh, uh, time frame, and then uh, with additional duties and delays due to COVID, uh, we're now receiving the final report uh, at this point. So people originally signed up for a much shorter period of time, but what I have to say is I was incredibly impressed with the dedication of the members of the committee. I remember uh, seeing them going out and touring different uh, facilities and uh, talking to different operators. Uh, they were meeting not just on a monthly basis, but in sometimes multiple times a month to uh, provide good quality information back into the reporting process. And so the commitment of these volunteers has been exceptional and uh, you have my deep gratitude uh, for that. I'll have some more comments at the tail end of the meeting but uh, at this point, we are here tonight to receive the final um, uh, uh, presentation. And so at this point, I'm just gonna check in with staff before we go over to committee members. Uh, I think the next thing is I'm gonna have uh, committee chair come up and introduce the task force members. Is that correct? Oh, those people are online there. Mr. Coe, are you going to be uh, coming to introduce the members or? We need to get you up on a microphone. So, sure. Yeah, we can. We can. Yeah, you can use one of those spaces. Just have to turn on the uh, microphone button there. I. Oh. I am the current chair of the Rental and Social and Affordable Housing Task Force, but we are having a presentation by the vice chair, Phil um, uh, Dupacquier and uh, Catherine Fagerland. So they're the ones who will be introducing you okay, to- I just wanted to make sure that everybody gets introduced properly, then uh, uh, no other comment from staff then. All right, so Phil Dupacquier, the ball has been passed over to you. Welcome to the uh, workshop for council. I can see you there. Uh, uh, it would be really great if you would uh, introduce the members of the Social and Affordable uh, Housing Task Force, please. 
Thank you very much, Mary Little. I appreciate that. So we've, we've built our presentation to um, introduce the people as we roll along, if that's okay. That's um, totally and, and also, Catherine's going to start us out just to make it another level of, this is how we're okay. rolling. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Mayor. Um, I'm Now I'm going to play with... <laughs> One of the reasons we were late a little bit was because we hadn't actually, we'd run through the, the presentation, but we hadn't actually done, run through the presentation trying to do it as a sli slideshow. So now I'm going to try to do that. Um, let's see if I can get this to roll. Oops, it's on the wrong screen, of course. Um, let me see. I just need to, get, I'm used to Teams, not Zoom. It's different. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, what what are you guys seeing? Oh, I think you guys are seeing the right thing, aren't you? Right now, I'm. Still no, seeing you're not it. seeing. No, you know, you know, I can see what you're seeing, and it's not the right thing. So let me see what I can do here. Um, let me just don't say. Hang on, I'll get. I'll Mr. get us. Mr. Back. Milburn, can you advise on sharing her screen? Uh, your worship uh, staff can also um, bring the presentation up if that's helpful for for Catherine. Sure, why don't you do that? Because then I, because my problem has been trying to figure out um, how to get the screen, the main screen up, and then also watching the notes. I haven't done it in Zoom before, so it's a new thing for me. Okay, I'll just ask staff then if they could pull it up and uh, sure. Catherine, just advise when you would like the slide. Um, yeah, and, and Phil and I will, Phil and I will switch things back and forth, so that will work just fine. Great, thank you. So when you have it up, I'll know. There you oh, are. No. Thank you. Yeah, you 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 people are seeing the same one that we've uh, we passed it on to Josh earlier, and I think Josh passed it on to you. Sorry about not getting it to you a little bit sooner. Um, we were working on a few details right up to the last minute. So um, this is the presentation by the Rental, Social, and Affordable Housing Task Force of our final report. Um, this presentation, the way we've, we've set up this presentation is basically a quick roadmap, at least I hope it's a quick roadmap, because we want to leave lots and lots of time for you to ask questions um, of the final report and of highlights learned, uh, of things learned and, and recommendations going forward. So next slide, please. Yeah, and this is just to remind everybody of the background. Um, in 2011, we published an OCP. The OCP resulted in uh, quite extensive growth or, or uh, initiatives towards quite in extensive growth in the district, um, and, but not necessarily affordable, grow affordable housing, but a lot of growth and that caused a lot of problems within the within the um, the district. And then in 2018, we had an election, all of you were elected and um, thank you very much for being for running and for being elected, um, largely on on a mandate of trying to reevaluate the OCP goals and the implementation of those goals. Um, so that's and then so we are the Rental Social Affordable Housing Task Force. We are a committee of council. We had a two year man mandate that ran to two and a half hours. We are cross sectional in terms of representation of the of the community, um, and we published an interim report on September twenty eighth, and we. You, we do see that you have implemented some of the changes in that report or some of the recommendations, the priority recommendations in that report, and we thank you for that. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Phil to get to the next one. So next slide, please, and Phil. Thanks, Catherine. So Catherine took a little bit of, uh, of my steam away because some of the things that she talked about was what I wanted to talk about. So fundamentally, uh, um, a big part of this council, when the election was, was going on in 2018, development was a huge thing, development traffic, as it always is, and housing and that kind of thing. And a lot of you, or if not all of you, talked about development necessarily isn't a bad thing, but correct development is what we needed. And that's commendable, and that's kind of where we're coming at this from, right? So appointing this task force was outstanding, it was a great idea, but it's only step one. So we're gonna give you a whole bunch of stuff that we think should be done, a whole bunch of recommendations. It's up to you to actually complete this task. So, so that's kind of an uh, uh, underlying theme that we're seeing here. It's like, okay, we're giving you the stuff. Now it's up to you to actually complete this task. So, so far, you know, from our interim report, there are traps being done. You've hired a senior planner. Uh, you're looking at some lands that can be done, which is all super commendable. 
Uh, we're in a great space right now because there's just been a federal uh, election, a provincial election not too long ago, and both of the uh, elected parties, elected governments, are also very interested in working with housing. And we know that typically this stuff kind of gets downloaded all the way down to the municipality, so you have to deal with it. But right now, we're lucky enough that we have um, other governing bodies, senior governing bodies, that are at least seemingly willing to work with you. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So as a, an overview, you know, when we talk about this, we talk about affordability and that kind of thing and, and defined it. I thought it'd be just a really interesting statement just to say, look, this is what's going on. We can talk about affordability. We can talk about a lot of things. But right now, from what our findings is, it because it, you'd have to make about $63,000 to rent a one-bedroom apartment in North Vancouver right now, which works out to about $33 an hour. And as you can see by the slide, the newly increased minimum wage is $15 an hour. So the gap is huge, right? And, and I'd hope that this is sort of an underlying concept that everybody has in their minds when we start approaching this is we can talk about, you know, where affordability is and that kind of thing, but we're not even close. we got so much room, right? So let's push to make this happen. Next slide, please. So then in terms of the OC OCP, the growth target was about 10,000 new units by 2030. Um, so far, we're doing really well in market rental. We're not doing so well in non-market. And this, this little table here is just a quick and dirty kind of um, compilation of the, of the statistics that we have. Um, to meet the 2030 demand, we needed social and support of 1,515 units. Market rental, we apparently needed 4,515 to December 31st, 2020, we've got 34% of the social and support, or we've got only 34% of the social and supportive, whereas we have 69% of the market rental filled. Um, the deficiency therefore is, is in, out of balance in terms of we're getting it done for market rental, we need to get it done for social and supportive and move on. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the, another thing, this was, this was a piece of information that came at us at, as, at a certain point. Um, consider, consider first of all that, in, this is only 2011 and 2016, recognize that, but in 2011, $40,000 was about, is it the same as about 43,000 in 2016? So what this pointed out to us so clearly, if you look at the difference, there's the number of houses, households in various income categories in 2011. And then you look at the same income um, income category in 2016. Then you look at the difference on the right hand side of the screen and suddenly you can see that we've grown in the over $100,000 category. We've lost so many households in, in the categories below, um, below 100,000. That's concerning. Um, I'm not sure if that's as a, as a direct result of affordability of housing, but it probably has a lot to do with it. Next slide, please. Yep. <laughs> so um, we took the six goals of the, the previous housing task force and uh, we, we started looking at that. And Remarkably, we came with came back with over 50 recommendations and we weren't even aware of this as we were putting this together. It was just a recommendation. We should do this and, and that kind of thing. But when we stepped back and looked at it, it was like there's 50 recommendations within six schools. That's that's pretty commendable, I think. But it also leaves a lot of work for you and staff. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, part of me wants to apologize for giving you so much work, but part of me says, let's get to it and that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that we looked at was, you know, we looked at all the goals, but the, the partnerships established within the group were responsible for deeper dives into each goal, and we'll start going into that. So can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, and as Phil was saying, we kind of came up, we, we looked at the six, the six goals that we have came out of the RAS, the rental affordable housing strategy that existed before us. Um, and when we looked at those, we can divide those into two 
two major categories. One is create new affordable housing. And under those, you can see they're not number, apologies for that, but that's just the way it broke out. Goal one was to expand the supply and diversity of existing housing, of or the supply of and diversity of housing uh, in within the district. And Phil and Eli Mellon took, took that, took the deeper dive there. Um, um, I will go through each goal, and I'll give you just a just very high level summary of what of some of the some of the findings in goal one: reduce obstructions for new new and innovative housing co concepts, for instance, tiny homes and co-housing. Um, facilitate the diversity within the neighborhoods. Um, oh, the OCP says 10 to 25 percent of growth outside of town centers, so, and that support that that view was supported by the OCP review. Um, in goal two, expand the supply of new rental and affordable housing. That was Bruce Crow and Hassam De Dehami. Sorry if I didn't say that right, Hassam. So far, new so far new market condos predominate. We need to reverse that ratio. Um, family units are needed, and we need to um, allocate. The, uh, one of the other recommendations is to allocate the developers' contributions that come out of new development to a housing reserve fund. And we need to use that housing reserve fund solely for affordable housing. This is what we're saying here is by no means all of the recommendations under each goal. It's just kind of how it highlights. And then goal six, goal six was partner with other stakeholders to help deliver affordable housing. This is possibly one of the most important goals in terms of the short term, in, in the short term. Um, you need partner, partnerships to help fund some of the housing. And what I'll just add in there is um, Michael Sadler, Ian Collis, and Derek Holloway took Sorry, that one, goal six. That. No, but what's <laughs> remarkable about all those people is they have experience in outside housing providers, right? Michael's with BC Housing, Derek worked for CMHC, and Ian is super involved with the nonprofit uh, world and, and that kind of thing. And I, I apologize, Ian, I can't remember exactly what your title is, but he knows his stuff. Can we have the next slide, please? So the, the next sort of breakout was sort of protecting our existing and affordable housing. And we had three goals in there. And the first goal we're going to talk about is the goal three, to maintain and retain existing. And this is where Catherine, who you've already met, and Ian Cullis also stepped into that one. Um, so what we found there is older rentals are always, this isn't rocket scientists, they're always more affordable. It's always more affordable than a new build. But the 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 question on that is when we talk about new builds is the net change in, in affordability, right? So if a developer says, hey, I'm going to, you know, put in 10 affordable units, but we're losing 40, then we've actually had a net loss of 30 units. So those are the kind of things that we have to keep on things. And, and consistent with that is one of the things we found is they talked about units instead of bedrooms. So they put in, you know, we're putting in 10 affordable units, but it's only one bedroom units and we're losing three bedroom units. So these are the games that we just have to be super aware of and that kind of thing. Um, and at where we can, as we can, and preserve what we have through policy and reg regulation. And again, that's coming back to you. So goal four was replace the existing with conditions. And uh, Keith Collier took this one <laughs> on his own. So Keith get extra stars if you're giving out stars afterwards uh, um, for, for dealing with this on his own. Um, so what we talked about is kind of what the mandate is, what you guys have is redevelopment is conditional on the benefit of the community, right? So what does redevelopment look like and how is it helping your community rather than someone's pocketbook? Uh, goal five was to minimize tenant impacts. And we were super fortunate to have uh, Kelly Bond involved in this and everybody on council, I think, is aware of Kelly's, uh, um, the tragic situation around em Emory and that kind of thing. So she has a personal, um, I don't know, a, a, a touch to this and that kind of thing, which is invaluable. And then she had Heather Fowler helping her. And I can't think of a better partner for this situation because Heather is probably the nicest person I've ever met. Uh, um, so coming out of that was the R trap, which was rewritten and reestablished. And I think Kelly will be talking about, I hopefully will have an opportunity to talk about that. As good as it was, we think there's room for improvement on that. And I know she's reached out to, if not all the council and mayor, then uh, 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 most of you, on our feelings on that. Um, and we also talked about 
minimize the impacts on tenants. This is, these kind of policies are not, you know, we're not in a bubble here. Every municipality is there. And so what's best practice? And right now we're really curious about what's going on with the, the Burnaby policy. And we think that might be best practice. So maybe we should look at that in, in improving our, our, our trap. Next slide, please. So we're trying to keep this to as quickly as possible. So we're already going to what's needed going forward. So we, we, you know, it's outstanding. You've hired a senior planner who, whose job is to take on this. But what we talk about is, is leadership is how you're going to support that. And leadership, it comes from everybody in the district and it starts with council and mayor right? What you say is what's going to happen. So if you say this has to happen, it's going to happen, right? This is on you. So we, uh, um, we want to ensure that this hiring is going to be supported, is going to have a voice and is going to be listened to, right? And we want to talk about, you know, creating policies, procedures, and programs to protect and, and ref uh, um, promote the affordable rental Sorry, I'm reading my notes and that kind of thing. We also want to uh, modernize the development process. We talked to any developer, and I'm sure you guys have heard from more developers than I have, about the, the, the challenges of getting things moving forward, right, in a timely manner. So the lag is a big issue here. When we, we build affordable, how long does it take to get on stream and that kind of thing? So we have to look at that. So that's when, you know, again, leadership happens, right? We have to do better better at this. Um, then we talked about the funding av advocacy and, and partnerships. And I think we alluded to the important of, of partnerships and we talked about the federal government and the First Nations uh, um, and the provincial government and they're all ready, you know, to, to play ball, to, to work with us. But we didn't talk about sort of uh, the other nonprofits, whether it's a church group that's willing to step in there or, or an advocacy society, like, you know, the women's shelter that you put in, that kind of thing. Um, being actively involved with this will um, help out, with, my cat's gonna walk into my window, uh, will help out with the funding, which is key for North Vancouver in particular, because land is so expensive, so expensive. So um, we, can't emphasize enough on this is a, a real key, at least in the short term, to unlock this, right? The other thing we talked about was monitoring progress. And this is a bit of a challenge right now um, because there is a lack of data. We, we came across that pretty quickly. Um, so the, we just need more information to what's going on there. Like, you know, how many basement suites are in North Vancouver? Not really sure. So how affordable are they? Not really sure. We need to capture that data in, in a manner that it can be processed and, and evaluated and, and become part of the equation. Because right now it's kind of an outlayer and we can't we can't deal with it as part of the equation. So you know it, it's kind of hard on that. Um, we want to create an affordable housing matrix so we understand what affordable is, right? Um, yeah, and, and we, uh, the other thing that we've talked about is making these recommendations in this matrix very transparent so everybody in the district can know how many affordable units are in the district how many affordable units are coming on stream how they can get involved in this kind of thing because if people don't understand where this information is available to them they won't access it they just they just won't there you go so Kathy, you're going to talk about the uh, yeah. assumptions now. Improve, yeah, and um, improving citizen engagement. So these these things that you're looking at on the screen, these are these are key things that we think you need to do in terms of moving our recommendations forward. I mean, obviously, looking at the recommendations within within the context of these six six bullets. So in improving citizen engagement, we think that there needs to be an advisory planning commission that's devoted specifically to, to rental social and affordable housing. We also would would be happy to see a follow-up committee to our task force um, that would monitor specific, something like you did with the OCP, you had the OCP implementation committee. We wouldn't mind, we think it would be good in terms of transparency to, to, for you to have some sort of a follow-up committee that looks at our recommendations and, and, um, and views um, implementation of those recommendations. Another big deal, 
con confirm assumptions. Um, we were asked to look at the question of affordability. Turns out, and I think you already know this, that's a very, very complicated question. But what we did find for sure is that affordability needs to um, specifically reflect the community context. It's no good building something that is called affordable housing, costs twelve hundred dollars a month in an in an in a neighborhood where the rental is seven hundred dollars a month. That's not the same as affordable housing. So you need to look at it within the community context. There was a recently a story on the CBC about somebody in Nova Scotia building affordable housing for about $1,700 in a, in a neighborhood that had $857 rents as an average. Um, the other thing is, um, the, one of the other assumptions that needs looking at is does more housing necessarily mean more affordable housing? Don't think so. Um, so reevaluate how more affordable housing happens in terms of not don't just throw more housing at the, at the picture. I think throwing more affordable housing. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the housing continuum on the next slide. Um, but one final bullet on this, um, ensure sustainability. We, um, we've, you've declared a climate emergency. Um, there is an accel accelerated step code in, in place, um, but which is great. I think you can go further. I think I think um, developers are are happy to. Or developers don't like living with um, an uneven playing field. Create a level 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 playing field. Make that playing field high level. Um, in terms of sustainability, we have a climate emergency going on. And then the other thing is take a long term view. We are building temporary shelters. It is necessary at the moment to build temporary shelters. That's not long term housing. We've already said previously in this presentation that existing housing is more affordable than new housing. I think that will continue to be an equation as we move forward. So create new housing now that is going to be there for a while. Make sure it's maintained. Um, you have policies and procedures around maintaining um, um, that. And in terms of, and, in, and the other thing is in terms of operations, if it's, if it's a good um, building in terms of climate consciousness, it's also a less expensive building to run. I know you guys have, have had a whole bunch of, um, um, information thrown at you about electric electrical costs and whatnot, but there are other factors. There is there is whether you need electricity, whether you need to heat the building that much in the first place. Um, and I, I, I think in terms of when you're building a, affordable housing, look at the long term view. Look at all the all of all of all of the costs, not just pulling out something like that. So finally. Next slide. Oh, your next slide is the uh, housing continuum. Just one thing, this this housing continuum keeps coming up all over the place. Um, and we're thinking that some of these targets need, this, these targets are being followed by your staff because it's the housing continuum. But some of those, some of those targets look a little questionable to us. For instance, that red box, um, in term, when we're talking about affordable, there's no more co-op. There's no more co-housing. There's no more affordable housing home ownership in this housing continuum. You don't need, apparently you don't need to grow in those areas. Really? I think you do. Um, we think you do. So those are the kinds of factors. Um, the other thing is if you look at the overall um, numbers, these, these numbers down here are yeah, the, this one doesn't grow at all. If you look at the totals, if you look at all the totals of the housing units, and we've been told that you can't look at just the pure totals that there, but if you look at the totals of all these housing, you'll find that the market market housing is 94% of the total target. Nonprofit, non-subsidized housing is only 0.7% of the target. Maybe we need to reevaluate re that. Phil? Yeah, so... Uh, um... You know, we were talking about new versus affordable again. We're circling back there kind of thing. The emphasis, I mean, we live in a market-driven society, so the emphasis is always on new, right? Um, it, it's just not affordable unless it's subsidized. So so it has to be balanced with retention of what is we can clearly see is affordable right now. And this goes back to what we were talking about previously. Um, if it is necessary to uh, replace this affordable housing, how's that going to look and make sure that we don't lose those in our community that are living there? It's just that simple. And everybody agrees with that, right? Uh, nobody's going to say 
be gone, you, right? Everybody wants everybody to live in our community. It's just a matter of how we're going to do it. But it's important, once again, to be cognizant of it constantly when you're looking at anything coming in front of you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask Catherine to talk about the uh, regional growth strategy because she's most more on Well, I, I watched the Metro Van regional growth. Um, Peter Teven spoke to that and brought up some really excellent points. Um, you and I, and I was happy to see that, um, and I, I actually spoke as well. Um, Metrovan is is when I've seen Metrovan present before, when I've seen what Metrovan, how Metrovan is in, influencing the district of North Van, um, I didn't see as much questioning as I think there should be, and I was very happy to see that there is more questioning going on 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 in terms of what Metrovan is saying. We need we need to also say what we need. We know it better. We live here. Next slide. So, and you can roll to the next slide, please. So what we wanted to leave with our, our, our final thoughts is the UN has, has, you know, obviously stated that housing is a human right. Uh, Canada's national housing strategy has stated the same thing. So it's being downloaded to you. You're not gonna fix it, but it's just important to be cognizant of the fact that this is a human right we're dealing with. This is, you know, like, clean water, right? You know, things like this. This is really important. And it's, it's, it's a key to making our community better. That's what I'd like to leave you with. So thank you for your time. And thank you, Catherine, for guiding me through this. <laughs> and and I, we apologize for taking a little bit more time than we thought we would take. We were trying to keep it down to 15 minutes. I think we ran over that a bit. Wanted to leave more time for you. Go for it. <laughs> and we were trying to keep the uh, task force down to a few months, but you guys went uh, and did so much more above and beyond the call that uh, that's certainly easy to understand why it's a more complex issue to convey back to the public. Uh, I did want to express a, 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 an additional thanks uh, specifically to, um, to the staff from the District of North Vancouver who helped assist the committee. Now, uh, Josh Cairns helped prepare the report that was that is here. We now have uh, Emmy Lee uh, helping out as the uh, planner and Ariel Daly uh, helped out with the uh, RTRAP uh, um, uh, rental tenancy uh, uh, assistance program. And uh, we also, I believe Natasha Letchford helped out at one point. We've had a few staff members over the course of the last couple of years that, uh, that were able to be of assistance and, uh, and they will be in assistance to council for a long time going forward, helping us better understand these issues. And I'm so glad that they were around the table with you to help uh, convey that. So just wanted to express my appreciation to them. Uh, council members, so, so this is a workshop style. So what's going to happen is we're welcome to have, we, we're, we're, so what we're gonna do is we have um, uh, this matter is here for discussion tonight, both by the committee members, the council members, and we do have a couple members of the public that have participated as well to the meeting. Um, and then what's gonna happen is it's gonna come back to a regular meeting of council with a staff report. And so the staff are going to go and they're gonna look at what has been implemented, what is in the works, and what is future projects that we're gonna to have to work on in, in the longer term. And I anticipate that uh, report coming back to council and being on a regular council meeting agenda uh, later in the fall, possibly in November, uh, and we'll but we'll advertise that leading up to it. But uh, at this point tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the final report is on the table for workshop. Uh, this has uh, been the culmination of years of work, uh, volunteer and professional work, and people contributing their their personal time and talents to be able to produce this document, which has already helped guide many decisions here in the district. So. At this point, uh, are there any uh, comments from members of council that would like to add to the to my comments? Councillor Mary. Uh, thank you, Mayor Little. Um, well, first of all, I feel that's really loud. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank um, all the members of the committee um, for your hard work. I know you were meeting like a lot and, um, you know, when we ask citizens to apply to take part in these committees, we know it's a big commitment. It's a lot of work. And obviously this issue um, ha is a, an enormous amount of work as you've presented to us tonight. And there's much more work to do into the future. But 
we just, I, I, I think I can say this on behalf of all of council that we're grateful for the commitment that you put forward and the willingness to meet more um, because there was so much work to deal with. Um, I, the other thing I'd like to say is, um, you know, really just the caliber of your expertise and your own personal experiences, your professional qualifications. Um, what, uh, what an incredible report that you've given us and presentation. You all get it, obviously. Um, some of you have lived through it. Um, you know, Kelly and, and Heather have lived through uh, the worst part of the housing crisis in regards to losing a home. Um, and uh, certainly those um, that come with professional credentials understand this huge complexity and we couldn't have, you know, put a, I think a better group of people together to um, come forward with the recommendations that you've made. Yes, it's, a, it's an emotional issue and um, I'm elated by what you've presented because finally I think, um, you know, something is going to change going forward. It's so frustrating to watch people um, that have, you know, grown up here struggle to stay here. It's um, it's heart wrenching. Um, you know, personally, I'm in a position right now where I don't know if I can, um, you know, stay in this community or purchase a house in this community. Um, I'm renting right now, and it's frightening to be in a rental market um, where it's so expensive. Um, you have three kids, and um, I have three kids, two dogs, and a cat. And trust me, I'm not on the first. I'm not the first one on the list that they want to rent to because of all of those uh, challenges that, um, you know, uh, people that are renting homes see. They want the, um, the couple with no pets um, that's really quiet and I don't come from a quiet household. Um, so it's very challenging. Um, and uh, and I'm, I, I, I consider myself lucky because I, I do have some, I do have means to be able to buy something. It may not be what I came from, but I have something. Whereas there's so many people that have no means at all and they're trying to stay in this community. And it's very, um, it's very, very challenging. And unless you walk in the shoes of those people, I don't think you really realize the stress that it, um, it in, that you incur um, during that, that challenging time of finding a place to live, which as Mr. DePasque pointed out is a human right. Um, the numbers that you presented in the presentation, um, sad, uh, but true. 94% and correct me, Catherine, if I'm wrong, at the end on the um, housing continu continuum. Um, can you just you say those numbers again? 94, I think, or 96 and then 0.7. Oh, you're muted. I'll unmute. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's what that was. If you look at the housing continuum at the total numbers, um, and and what the housing continuum says we need to grow by, the growth is all is ninety four percent in the in the market side and zero point seven percent on the non market non non profit. This is what the community was saying up until the um, beginning of the last election. Mayor Little, as you know, they were saying stop with the market, stop tearing down the affordable housing that we were supposed to maintain as part of the official community plan. You know, the official community plan was a document that we we supported. You and I supported that that document because it talked about protecting light industrial, protecting commercial, protecting older housing, protecting older rental housing, because it was affordable, you know, creating a sustainable community, protecting the environment, um, you know, doing all the things that any local government would want to do to look after their community and make it sustainable going forward. And yet from the time that document was, uh, was um, adopted, the market was the priority in every single case. And we were losing businesses, we were losing industrial land, and we were losing residential homes for people that had grown up here, been born here, um, you know, and some were close to the end of their life, and they were losing their homes, and uh, it wasn't okay. Um, I know Ms. Bond, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you commented in regards to Metro 2050 and the median income um, that Metro is looking at somewhere around 76 down to 63, I think it is, um, in comparison to ours, which is 102,000. You know, um, such a huge gap, and you've illustrated that that gap, that gap is so significant and that we, have, we still have so much work to do. Um, you know, I, I was... I didn't know what was going to be presented tonight, and I just I'm so impressed that you you knocked off the the top, 
you know, um, priorities that we have to look at going forward. Um, I think I watched Mayor Little, we were both while you were speaking, Catherine, nodding our head up and down, um, because you really have, uh, you really have um, hit the nail on the head in every single category. In regards to the number of units, the net change, such a huge issue. You know, we can talk about, oh, we're going to replace some affordable housing in this condo development, but it's not the unit, it's the number of beds. And that relates to being able to accommodate families here and not just studio apartments or one bedroom. We know that we have so many uh, one bedrooms in the district. Um, so those are my initial comments. I, I have some questions that I want to ask some of the committee members, but I'll wait until others have a chance to also comment. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker up is uh, Councillor Curran. Thanks, everybody. Um, I can't see everyone because um, y'all are smart and you're probably in your pajamas and that's why you don't have your cameras on. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for it. I think there's some really uh, great information to take action on um, in this report. I think that was a theme that I heard. Um, but I, I am interested if any of the um, members on the committee want to say anything because I feel like we don't have enough um, opportunities to connect and I did check the minutes I did go to one meeting it wasn't in there um but I did enjoy reading the minutes um and I just I know there's so many great folks on the committee does anyone else um want to say anything love to hear from uh, you. so I'm gonna absolutely make sure that opportunity is available but uh, I do have a speakers list going and and if any members of the committee would like to either indicate that they'd like to speak and be added to the chat. You're just going to be inserted into the list and I'm happy to come to you. So Councilor Curran, the floor is back to you. Okay, I obviously I will never understand how these meetings work, but um, so I really want to, some of the, some of the recommendations in the report, I'm really looking forward to working um, on staff with the implementation. I'm really excited that we have a dedicated, um, staff member that's really looking at this um, and hopefully keeping us accountable and transparent um, as we move forward through this. I think there's a lot of um, big ideas that we haven't even begun to address yet that I'm excited to do. But I just wanted to touch on, um, you know, as, as policymakers, um, I hope that uh, by municipal government, by municipal government, um, you know, we start working together uh, to, to, to really demonstrate that, yes, we can look after people and we can grow and um, change. And um, it's not going to be easy, but I think that we can multi-solve and we can do a lot, of, a, a lot of great stuff. So I'm really excited about implementing um, some of these and having much bigger discussions. I think there's a lot um, of work to do in large swaths of zoning um, in the district that uh, are zoned for single family. Um, I don't know, hopefully that will come up um, for further discussion, but I, I would like to hear from you all. So I'll just say if, if anyone wants to reach out um, afterwards, um, I'd be happy to, to meet up. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kerner. Of course, the, the whole report was prepared with the input of uh, all members of the task force as well. One of the really cool things about the task force is they rotated the chair and so that uh, all the members got an opportunity to take on that leadership position and help coordinate the different reporting that was going on with different parties. Uh, it's something I haven't seen in another committee and I, I think that was really, I'm so glad that the personalities around the table that that worked well, but uh, uh, it definitely created a situation where people felt they could contribute and became quite invested in the process. Next speaker I have is Councillor Hanson. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, obviously, I'd like to begin by thanking the committee, uh, the expertise shown, uh, the meticulous work done, the quality of the report and the quality of the recommendations uh, was uh, very gratifying. And I think this report, uh, in my view, can serve as the framework uh, for our district's approach to housing in a way that will be constructive and uh, will benefit the community uh, for years to come. Like Councillor Kern, I also would be interested to hear from other members of the committee if we have time tonight. And if not, uh, I, I extend an invitation. I would be very keen to hear in more detail uh, the perspectives of all of the members of the committee. 
I can say that one of the benefits of the last uh, two months for me and the uh, speaking to so many people in our community is uh, I can say that this issue has never been uh, more important to the people that I met over the last uh, while. Everybody now is affected by circumstances and lack of affordability in housing. Uh, some of us may personally have housing, but it affects members of our family. Uh, on the campaign trail, I spoke about how my kids do not live in the community uh, and that affordability plays a role in that. And uh, that was a, a comment that I heard over and over and over again. People concerned about their own housing uh, affordability, but also the housing affordability for members of their family. Families are literally being torn apart in our community because of lack of housing affordability, and it is reaching a crisis level. Um, I agree, and Councillor Reary has set out her agreement, and for the same reasons I agree with the conclusions, the philosophy, and the tenor of the recommendations. Uh, there are 50 recommendations. I went through them carefully. I agree uh, with all of them as far as uh, I can tell. Uh, obviously, our task is going to be to prioritize and implement. I won't delve uh, more deeply into the individual recommendations tonight, as I understand there'll be an opportunity for this to come back before us and we will begin the stage of implementation. Uh, let me say though that I do support the creation of a District of North Vancouver Housing Authority and the General Manager of Housing to supervise the whole issue of the housing balance in our community. And I also support the uh, establishment of a committee to monitor our progress because clearly there's uh, a tendency to slide back into market approaches whereby we build million dollar and a million and a half dollar condos. And we say that's going to address housing affordability because it's addressing supply. It doesn't. And uh, for some, for, for various economic and market reasons, we keep sliding back in that direction. In fact, we're doing uh, some of that tonight in our special meeting of council. Um, and uh, so I do believe we really need to monitor very carefully uh, the implementation. I note as well that in 2018, there was a referenda. We have a, had a majority vote in favor of spending $150 million to construct a thousand units of housing. I think the community mandate is very clear. Uh, and I also will uh, just emphasize the importance, in my view, of partnerships. And I absolutely agree with Mr. Pasquay's comment that now is a opportune time to build those partnerships and that there is a real appetite on the part of senior government and uh, First Nations and perhaps other entities with whom we can partner in order to create the housing, uh, affordable housing supply that's so badly needed in our community. I think we really need to apply uh, tenacity at this stage because this is, a, I believe, a moment in history for the attainment of this goal. So I look forward to implementing these recommendations. I thank you again uh, for the hard work, for the direction that you've provided. And I think this is an exciting report, an exciting time for the district because I believe we have the roadmap we need to make significant progress on this extremely important community issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Uh, Phil DePacchier. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but from the beginning of the meeting, I didn't hear a land acknowledgement, and I don't know if it's typically done in these meetings. It would it be okay if I do one right now? You're welcome to. Okay, thank you. So I just want to acknowledge that we're uh, meeting virtually and in in person on uh, the traditional lands of the Squamish, the uh, Slay the Wattooth, and Muscogee people. And we're speaking about housing and what we have to take from that is, like so many other things, it dispro disproportionately affects these people. And it's ironic that we're on their land talking about housing and they're the ones who need it the most. So please take that into your mind as we go forward with this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, Councillor Beck. Thank you, Mary Little. Um, and thank you very much to uh, my colleagues for the comments so far. Um, I do want to just make a brief comment to begin with. And uh, like my colleagues, I'm very interested in hearing from other members uh, of the task force as well. But um, like my colleagues, I just want to acknowledge how much work has gone into this. Um, it is it is a really 
um, valuable body of work that you've you've summarized here in this final report. Um, I have gone through it, and um, like my colleagues, I agree with the recommendations. Um, not going to get too much into that at, at this point, but um, I'm certainly looking forward to staff coming back with uh, their report in terms of how we can take action on many of these uh, recommendations. Um, you know, one of the points that's, uh, that stood out to me in the report, and it was just kind of a minor point, but it was um, changing the attitude within our community around new and creative housing types. Um, I think we need to change our attitude uh, and the way we talk about housing in general. Um, and um, I, I'm really interested in, in hearing how, how we can do that uh, within the community. Um, you know, I do hear the comments that we don't need more market housing, but I would argue we still need market housing. Um, we still need a diversity of housing, which does include include some market housing. Um, but granted, we need to put much more of a focus on, on, on rental, affordable social housing, and, and the, the type of housing that's uh, really the, the topic of this report. Um, some of the other things I'm interested in, of course, partnerships, I think, are, are huge um, when we're looking across the North Shore and looking to First Nation, um, Squamish and tsleil -Tooth on the North Shore. Um, I think there's so much we can do by, by working together on, on addressing some of these challenges. Um, I was interested in the idea of an advisory planning commission. I know that's something that we don't currently have in the DNB, but I'm interested in how that works in other communities. I believe the city of North Vancouver um, has an advisory planning commission. So um, interested in hearing from staff on how on how that could potentially work. And like Councillor Hans, and I'm uh, also a th supportive of the idea of a housing authority within the DNB. I do think that that um, would be a, a very good thing uh, as we look to uh, have an ongoing look of, at this picture of the affordable housing picture um, and, and data. I think creating a housing authority would uh, would be a very good thing for the community. Um, so I've got more comments in terms of the recommendations, but right now I'd like to just give everyone a chance to, to weigh in. Thank you, Councillor Back, Councillor Bond, followed by Councillor Forbes. Councillor Bond, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Little. Uh, can you hear me? I'm on a new machine this week, so yes. sounds good. Um, perfect. Well, uh, first of all, I'd just like to express my most sincere and deepest thanks and appreciation and gratitude to the members of the of the committee. It's been hundreds and hundreds of hours of your own volunteer time uh, delving deep into this important issue and presenting these recommendations to Cal Council. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I want to maybe ask a, a few questions um, and uh, either um, uh, Phil or, or Bruce, uh, if you want to delegate <laughs> or, or Mayor Little uh, to, to who uh, on the committee might be best to, um, to answer those. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you'd be able to explain the 94% the number that was on the housing continuum that was, that was uh, talked about. I didn't really... Uh, understand uh, how that calculation was made and and, and the meaning of that. Catherine, you want to take this? Catherine, uh, Miss Pegelin's camera's off. I don't know if that means that she's. Uh, I'm here. Away sorry, her. sorry. No, no, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's just me um, playing with the. Housing continuum numbers, I like to play with data, I guess. Um, but if you look at, for instance, um, in the deficiency, the deficiency that's identified in terms of, um, of in terms of uh, social and supportive housing is uh, the, the unit number is 1,515. The unit number for, um, for, for everything is 13,150. 13, and as I, I cushioned this with saying that when Natasha was helping me look at this, she said, you can't just add it all up together, but all, we, all the numbers we've got is the housing continuum numbers. So if you look at- can we put the, Sorry, can we just put that slide up on the screen? Can staff put it up so we can- The totals refer? aren't there, yeah. <laughs> oh, the totals aren't there. Yeah, that's the trouble. Well, but, I think what you're getting to is that uh, the it's uh, that we have achieved 94% of the projected shortfall of of market through that process. That's what the number, the source of the number is. Is that correct? Um, no, not exactly. It's that 1,515 is allocated for um, social supportive, as opposed to 
11,635 of the deficiency is for um, market. Um, so out of a total of 13,150, 1515 is not, is not a very big percent. <laughs> Okay, I think I think the question was about the the delivery of the market side of the equation, and, yeah. and reported ninety four percent. Okay, according to delivery, if that's what you're interested in, just a minute, I need to go and figure my jiggle my numbers around a little bit. Well, um, honestly, it's uh, it's it's a question we can take away, perhaps, Councillor yeah. Bond, and we'll yeah. get that in for when we uh, have our report with with staff. Councillor Bond, the floor is yours. Just some clarification on the meaning of, of those percentages would be great. Um, one, I'll, get, I'll send them to you by email. Oh, great, thanks. Um, I'm wondering, uh, and I'm, I'm sure this probably came up a number of times during the committee's discussions, but um, talking about the tension of, um, or the tension around retaining old, older, uh, less expensive purpose-built rental buildings and how council actually, we local municipalities can't actually control the rent in those buildings. So, you know, a new tenant in a 50 year old building might pay $3,000 for a two bedroom uh, rental, whereas a tenant that's been there for 15 years may pay 1500. And, and so I'm wondering if, if that discussion around how effective a uh, maintaining old buildings is actually at maintaining low rents, where that came up. Mr. Dubacri, you're, you're muted. Apologize. Uh, I don't recall actually having that discussion in that manner. Uh, um, it's a very good point. And we also didn't really talk about the implications consistent with that as a rent freeze. Yeah. Right, put forward by senior government or anything like that. But those are all tactics around curating affordable housing and maintaining affordable housing in your community. Okay. Um, one other uh, question. We? Well, I think I've got maybe two more questions, Mayor, and then uh, I can pass along. I know in the report um, that the committee picked up on some of the contradictions in the OCP. Uh, you know, uh, we've mentioned uh, the goal of having affordable and inclusive com uh, communities, but then when you look at the land use plans are uh, part of the OCP, especially in Lynn Valley, I think it's probably one of the more stark ones, uh, where the only places for new housing were a mall and all of the old existing uh, purpose-built rent, rent, rental housing. And in, then uh, on top of that, there was a, a, a flexible planning framework put on top of that which also limits the ability to uh, achieve uh, affordable housing or, or other types of housing on top of that. So uh, I, was, uh, I was interested to, to see that um, in, the, in the report. I'm wondering if, uh, if the committee had any comments around kind of smoothing out some of those contradictions uh, in the OCP. Obviously the OCP is a, is a large uh, guiding document, not meant to be prescriptive uh, all the time, but uh, if the committee had any comments around uh, th those tensions where um, different goals of the OCP might conflict? Not beyond uh, uh, otherwise, you know, sort of recognizing the, 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 the tensions as you politely put it and that kind of thing. One of the things that we did sort of want to reiterate is as much as we talk about the town centers and growth in the town centers, that's one way to look at it, but there's also 10 to 25% outside of the town centers, which doesn't seem to get any traction. Everybody talks about town centers, town centers and growth. There's 10 to 25% of our growth should be outside of the town centers. Okay, great. Um, and then the other the other point um, or question I wanted to ask is if the committee had any discussions around this, um, and it seems we have a very high priority on um, family sized units um, uh, in the district. You know, a lot of the existing uh, homes that have been approved, whether they're market or, or non-market, tend to be, uh, you know, two or three bedrooms, uh, far more than half, I think, uh, during that's been approved since the OCP. And then all, uh, the vast majority of the existing housing, the, you know, 20,000 or so uh, single detached homes are also uh, larger family size units. And I'm wondering if the committee discussed the actual need for more smaller units, um, you know, given... <laughs> Uh, lower household sizes and a growing demand for independent living for, for
for younger people and and older people who might be only a single or a couple uh, if, if that uh, topic of discussion came up again not in the same manner uh, um the focus because of affordability what we looked at is you know who can afford these things um and uh, it was interesting because one of the things that came up very quickly was the difference between units and bedrooms and that focused on families and growth and in, in, in that period um and from there so our focus was not on that kind of demographics it, it was more on the overall you know what can be affordable and what we can deliver okay I might mm -hmm. add a little bit to that because Keith, Thank you. Keith yeah, sorry, Keith, uh, I th and you can actually ask Keith, Keith Collier a little bit more about this, but um, in terms of, of housing the, the upcoming elderly generation, that's me, by the way, um, and uh, Keith's, Keith's thing was that most, and this is consistent with the experience of um, many of us, um, is and and it's been actually raised as a complaint that that the the generation that's the elder generation that's coming up want to stay in our own homes keith had a lot of ideas about how to help how to how to not like keith kept saying i don't want to take housing away from people but find me a way of of allowing more housing in my house mm -hmm. because that's where i want to stay and that was my, my parents stayed till the day they died in the house that they they built together in the 1950s so awesome awesome um, now and um, this is you know, work, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, I've, I've read it all already, but I'm going to give it another read and uh, before it comes back to council. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Uh, I have uh, Mr. Uh, Bruce Crow in the uh, council chamber here has wanted to make a comment as well. Yeah, Councillor Bond, some excellent questions. Um, just to give you a sense of what we were thinking about, there was uh, one of your questions was about um, uh, how to identify whether the older homes will allow lower rents. Excellent question. So, but the first thing you have to recognize is one of our main recommendations is that we need more data because we, that's the kind of information that we can't figure out either, right? So that, that I hopefully will kind of address that as staff gets a chance to work over the document. Uh, one of the other things was simply around the flexible uh, um, framework that was done at Lynn Valley. That was one of the items I think that we talked about in goal two, where we actually identified that maybe that's not such a good thing to do there because it does change how these developers are able to apply their knowledge to the particular situation. So um, if Hassam is online, he would probably love to talk about that. Is he online, anybody? Okay. Yeah, he's in actually, uh, Mary Council. Uh, sorry, I'm actually driving to Vernon, but, um, uh, <laughs> and I can't um, put my video on, so I'm not on my PJs. Um, yeah, so there's some contradictory um, policies uh, that have been approved by I guess it was approved by a previous council in, in, in my neighborhood, Lynn Valley, mine and Bruce's neighborhood, um, that that changes things in, in terms of, you know, being able to actually reach our targets or, or not targets guides in the OCP and how, how, the, how our community basically evolves based on the uh, OCP uh, guidelines. So some of these, uh, some of these policies could uh, need to be reconsidered um, if, if the overarching um, guide is the OCP, they contradict the OCP uh, quite a bit. And, and to Ian's uh, point with regards to um, some of the other contradictory uh, things in the OCP, such as you know, creating these boundaries around Salem Valley Town Center and, and limiting growth to uh, plots of land that are already occupied with old uh, purpose built rental units. We, we did discuss that during our interim presentation as well. It's something that uh, uh, the, the staff and council need to uh, think about going forward in terms of how can, you know, if, if, if a developer comes in or, or, or a 
um, or a buyer comes in and buys an old uh, old stock purpose real rental, you know, sits on it and, and wait for, you know, or persuade the existing, persuade, I mean, you know, quote unquote, uh, of existing uh, tenants to, you know, slowly vacate the, 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 the property and then, you know, renovate it and actually, you know, rent those old stock purposeful rental at market rate that's sometimes you know twice what the previous tenant was paying then how can we you know how can we create a policy to discourage that uh, so you know the, 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 we we didn't get into that with our mandate was quite short and, and COVID uh, caused some challenges um, to discuss some of some of these other excellent issues that all council members have, have brought up but uh but we hope it's uh you know it's it could be another guiding document to uh create policies that lead to more diverse equitable and uh, uh, community at the end as targeted by or you know is the goal of the ocp so uh, thank you i'm going to give the floor back to uh to bruce crow yeah, um, Councillor Bond, the other question you had was about uh, whether we thought about smaller units and things like that. We absolutely did, and there's quite a few comments in the different goals identifying what we thought could be tiny homes, you know, just better secondary suites, you name it. There's a whole plethora of different possibilities that we feel need to be investigated. So if, if that supports what you're thinking, absolutely, we agree with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Councillor Forbes, followed by Curran and Murray. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm really excited about this report. You guys did great. Um, and I can't believe how detailed and how expertise the report is. It's impressive. You guys should all work as a team all the time. Maybe you could get Metro Vancouver in shape too. Anyway, to get back to, um, I, there's some things that I just wanted to emphasize that I totally agree with you on, and there might be one or two points or questions, but before I say that those, um, I was wondering if you could send, um, uh, send council your slideshow that you presented, and also um, I'm wondering, I, wanted, I want to have, uh, more of a dialogue with the committee members. And I was wondering if it's possible to have a uh, workshop with the committee or council attending one more committee meeting, if that might be something that the committee members would be interested in. Because I find this report, I've got tons of things I wanna ask questions about, and it would be nice to ask them in a room with most of the committee or all of the committee there. Than just so maybe someone could let me know if they're interested in one last meeting and council maybe <laughs> let the mayor know if they're interested in attending. Um, so I'm going to say just a comment on that, Councillor Forbes. So tonight is the official last meeting of the task force. Uh, we would have to establish new terms of reference to extend the term of the task force. Uh, but having said that, uh, from what I know of the people on the committee, uh, they're invested in this community and they're gonna be able to provide uh, information going uh, forward on a regular basis. I don't know that we have to have a formally struck uh, committee meeting in order to be able to benefit from their experience in this process. But uh, I hear your point. There's gonna be questions that come up over time and uh, some of that may be best addressed with a one-on-one -on -one where you can go back and forth with a bunch of questions. Uh, and then there's going to be other times where a specific call it policy that the council is considering at the time may uh, benefit from having uh, specific information from people who are around the table. But officially, this is the last meeting of the uh, of the committee. Okay, then I'd like to call a meeting on my own and we can meet for coffee with all of the committee because I think we've just had this report. Our, it's been published for a week and there's a lot to read in here. So. Um, Anyway, um, I want to get together with as many people that would like to get together. Having said that, um, I think you've hit a lot of the points.
points that have been hit before, but you hit them in much more detail and clarity, and that's a good thing for us to be able to go forward. So I appreciate that very much of all the committee members. Um, I think the definition of affordability is still sort of floating out there. Not everybody agrees on what affordability means. Some people think non-market means affordable. I don't happen to think that. I think it needs to be tied to income. Um, the uh, and I also find that there's a deficiency of information. Um, and you mentioned that as in your goals quite a few times. That you, there's just not the information. We can't find it. Um, and you know, you're you're basing on a lot of 2016 stats. Well, as quickly as the last decade has changed. 2016 to 2021 also there's been a big change and um, I think that um, um, I like your idea of talking about bedrooms rather than units because I think that's really important uh, units can be 500 square feet well you can't get a family into that um, I also like that you suggest communicating things out to the public more because I don't think the district as are the, we do a good job of that. Um, and that goes along with getting those stats. If we could communicate substantive information to the public, then I think they would understand better what we're talking about. Um, and I think it should be presented, like you mentioned, Phil, um, sort of a dashboard kind of thing that we can just update and it's there and whoever wants to go in and see it could go in and see it. But I think that communication link with the general public's really, really important. Um, um, uh, I think uh, I agree that we have done, we've tried, but we've had other forces uh, sort of uh, hold us back a little, but we haven't done well on employment housing and we should do much better on secondary suites. We should make that easier to get to. Uh, sometimes that funding though, it takes a while that maybe the district gets all its ducks in a row and we're ready to go with something. And when you're working with uh, a partner or possibly two other partners, sometimes it's not us that's slowing the project down, it's the partners. They're still trying to get their ducks in a row and get their okays. And, their sign offs. So I just, that's part of the whole process is we have to consider that they have different timelines than we possibly do. Um, I like the idea of working with First Nations on housing because we are synonymous. We drive through First Nations lands uh, to get from A to B a lot of times. And so I like the idea of working with them. At the moment, <clears throat> I'd like to work with them because at the moment First Nations, the projects that they have on the books right now, any kind of uh, affordability is being given to the band members, but if you're not a band member, then it's market price. So I'd really like to work with them and see uh, if we can do anything towards that. Um, and uh, the one other thing, and I, I have no connection with this author, and I have, I just read a book that I found extremely interesting and it applies to some of the stats that you're talking about and gives a rationale, an additional rationale, why, why the prices possibly went up so high and why the affordability, uh, non-affordability has happened so quickly in the lower mainland. And uh, it's an investigative reporter, Sam Cooper, and he wrote a book called Willful Blindness. And it's all about the uh, outside influences, foreign influences, um, um, gangs, money laundering, casinos. It's all about how money was moved around and how it came into Vancouver. And um, part of the stats that you gave on uh, um, percentage of homeowners and you think that it's due to no longer carrying mortgages. No, often it's what that could be the case, but often it can also be because um, you have very wealthy people from other parts of the world come in here and they don't need a mortgage, they just buy it. And so that shows that our percentage of homeowners goes up, um, but the disparity on income and affordability skyrockets. 
So uh, because also two thirds of foreign buyers usually leave whatever they buy empty. So we have housing and space and land being taken up with foreign buyers who don't use it as housing. They use it as an investment. So I think all of there's other factors that come into it too, but that's an excellent book if anybody kind of wants to get a peek at all that end of it. And I, I just want to say again, I'm so impressed with you guys. And if none of you phone me for coffee, I'll be phoning you. <laughs> thank you very much for everything you did. I appreciate it. So thank you very much, Councillor Forbes. Uh, and so where we're sitting now, uh, I think that's all the first time speakers that have been, uh, expressed an interest in speaking. We have about 45 minutes left until we have to go to the special meeting of council. Uh, I would like to get an opportunity for members of the public beyond the committee to say a few words. So I just ask uh, uh, people who are speaking a second time to keep their comments brief. Councillor Muring. Um, thank you, Mayor Little. Um, uh, and I would like to hear from the other members of the task force too, if, they, if there's anybody else that wants comments beyond whoever's raised their hands. Um, so we've had um, a great discussion on the ideas that this task force has br brought forward and, and some of the suggestions as to how we move forward. What were the challenges as members of the task force? What, was, um, what were some of the challenges that you faced and what are the recommendations in regards to those challenges that you can make to council? I see Mr. Um, Crow here in the auditorium. Did you want to comment or? Sure, I can make yeah, a comment. Mr. Crow here. Thank can you, you take your, is there any way you could just take your mask off while you speak? It's Does hard it to hear you through that big mask. I prefer it for sure. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, considerations during the uh, two years, and by the way, Mayor, we were mandated for two years, so we stuck to that. So the, um, uh, I guess uh, to start with, I guess I need to identify, and I think somebody's already said this anyway, but the, uh, the advisory oversight committee, I think that's the name, um, really did a heck of a job in putting together 11 people who are such a, a variety of individuals, both talent-wise and perspective, and yet we managed to come together to put this report, to, it really is, you guys, I don't know how you put it, jigsawed it together, but it's a it's fairly impressive job. So um, uh, I think, if anything, the, the one comment on that side of it is simply that with all those different ideas and perspectives, we still came up with most of the ideas that were discussed at the meetings eventually making its way into the report. It's, there was very little that was sort of no way that's going to happen. There was, none of, there was none of that at the table. We generally did debate things hard at times, but we generally wound up keeping it in some fashion. Um, so there were fi roughly 50 meetings over the two years. And I can actually say that I was the only one that actually attended almost every play one of them. <laughs> so I guess I shouldn't say that, but the, um, um, I guess that's, I, I guess I just have to chalk that up to the, this is my retirement years and I can do what I want, right? So when the pandemic didn't hurt either, it gave me something to do in those, those late nights when the, there was no TV. So, but um, um, in fact, I, I attribute that somewhat to the fact that uh, uh, because we were rotating um, uh, chairs every three months, it was interesting getting to see how people understood what a pain in the neck the job is, Mayor. <laughs> So, and so uh, by the end of it, it, a lot of people have gone through, some have just refused to do it. But uh, at the end of it, I've been now the chair for six months and there were three months before that. So everybody got a flavor of the crow. And so now that uh, I've been doing it for six months and I've been sitting back trying to understand why I let myself get into this. But it really was something that I think a lot of folks just recognized that they didn't want to do it. Um, and as a committee of the council, Right? I don't even think the staff knew exactly what to do with this. Right? this they aren't used to these kind of situations where we're supposed to be reporting to the council. Right? And that did cause some of these questions that uh, Councillor Muir is asking about. And I know that um, the mayor may not even be totally sure, uh, uh, sure of what this is identified as, but he's reminded me of two or three times of when he bumped into me and Kelly, uh, Mrs. Bond, at the, um, at the library. And that was a situation that had gotten out of control. And we had to sit down with the staff to sort out the fact that 
Okay, when we need, uh, uh, when we have approved our minutes, they should not be being changed before they go on the website. So there was lots of little things like that. Uh, and the, on, on the, one of the other discussions at that same meeting was the fact that at, this was at the very start of January uh, 2nd or something like that, 2020. So um, it was before the pandemic started, of course, but it was still, we were trying to figure out how and who it actually runs the show, whether it was the staff or whether it was the, the committee. And so this was a situation where we'd had to cancel a meeting and I said, well, let's do it next week. And they refused to do it. So that's just the way it happens, you know, and, and suddenly this is a situation where the mayor just happened to be in the library at the same time. And he said the perfect, a perfect comment that really made everything change directions. And we had a, a meeting set up within two days. That's the kind of impact that having a, a direct relationship with the council can really do for you. And that was the one thing that I did notice when I was looking at some of the other lower mainland task forces on housing. Almost every one of them had at least a couple of councillors. Some of them had the mayor involved. Mm -hmm. So that would be a major bonus going forward. If you're really doing a task force like this, you need to give it some firepower. Mm -hmm. It would make life a lot easier because that would have alleviated one of the other things the mayor came to talk to us about was the fact that, and I, it was a question that I led him with, was simply, um, how do we get this data on bedrooms? I thought it was critical. Most of the, uh, the task force thought it was critical, but we couldn't actually get the staff to get us the information that we wanted. And the mayor just came in and said, oh, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. And within, uh, I, I, I even called the mayor. That's right. I called you right after the, the thank you, because all of a sudden it was like switching a switch. And we had data within the two or three weeks by the finally they got around to get it, picking it up. So, um, uh, but there's, I, get, I think there's always that sort of push pull with staff and the, the chair and the council and the, the task force and who's actually running it. And that was with the fact that we had three different uh, 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 people involved in uh, coordinating our efforts with the staff then it made it a little tricky at times trying to educate everybody once the new person came in okay well this is what we thought we'd made progress to and then having to re uh, retrain everybody on okay well this 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 is just how we do it you know we want to make this happen so that means that we have to all sit together and make sure our plan is coordinated so that was another situation where getting everybody on the same page is really what it amounted to, but it did make it somewhat more difficult when you had at least a minimum of three different coordinators over that period of two years. Um, I, it, I think that covers most of the issues that I ran. Most of the other things that came up were related to that in one way or another, just in communication, et cetera, et cetera. Even today, right, the mayor had to kind of step in and sort of make sure that we were all invited properly to the meeting tonight. You know, this was at two o'clock this afternoon. We were still trying to figure out how we were going to get on. So it's, it's little things like that that would, I think having um, a more direct link to council would be a major plus just for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coe. Um, as the chair of the AOC, I know we've we've touched on this um, issue. Councillor Kerr and Councillor Forbes are both members of that committee. And um, appointing a council member, we do have council members on different committees. Um, Councillor Bond sits on the Heritage Committee. And it's certainly there is a great synergy between having a councillor on a task force or a committee going forward to, to be able to bridge some of those challenging uh, situations. But thank God you guys go to the library a lot, and so does the mayor, and you were able to suss everything out that way. I know um, just a few times during this presentation, the issue of collection of data has been brought up as well and the challenge of getting the data and actually having a, a matrix to be able to know how many bedrooms we have, how many one bedrooms, how many two, three bedrooms, affordable housing, you know, 20 year old housing, 40 year old housing, 60 year old housing, all of that information in one place. And I know there's municipalities and I think Burnaby is used uh, as a regular example about the kind of information that they are able to collect. And I think it's something that we really need to work towards because it gives council and the community that picture that we need in order to be able to move forward um, in a direction that we need to go to because we're sort of maxed out in this area. So let's pivot and shift um, into another direction. Um, just my last comment, Mayor Little, um, um, is that um, Mr. Derek Holloway sits on this committee too, and as a former member of BC, uh, former employee of BC Assessment, 
Um, I think Mr. Holloway brought a wealth of knowledge um, to the committee. Um, and, um, you know, the, the assessment issues, we've talked about highest and best use. We continue to um, work with the provincial government on the issue of highest and best use, how it affects uh, commercial properties, retail properties, um, but certainly evaluations of land. And, and, and it really is, it really does get down to the, to the value of land. And we were talking about smaller uh, properties, uh, smaller units, but smaller land that can maybe accommodate, you know, a carriage house or a, a basement suite or a tiny house. And one that always comes to mind um, was uh, a piece of property that was owned um, many years ago, decades ago, um, by the contractor that built my father's house in Deep Cove. Um, he lived on Beaufort and Mount Seymour Parkway. His name was Pete Marquist. And uh, two instances that I know of um, in the Seymour, one was uh, on the street that I used to live on, Seymour Boulevard, um, a, a piece of property was subdivided in 1965 by the Hammer Jacksons into, into three lots. And then this one was also subdivided um, on the parkway at the same time into two lots. And they are 3,000 square foot lots and they are assessed at 1.57 million. Um, just down the street from where the mayor lives, and I often joke that I bet the mayor could have st could stand in the house and spread his arms out and touch wall to wall. There's an easement off, off of one part of the property into the inside lot, and the house is so close to $1.9 million. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the tale of, you know, those kinds of assessments are so... Um, you know, into the stratosphere, you wonder when the ceiling's going to crack and, and what's going to happen when the, you know, $30 million homes on the waterfront, what happens to them in 20 years? Are they worth 70 million? Are they worth 80 million? Are they underwater maybe? I, I don't know, right? Like it's, uh, it's something that we really need to manage. And I'm not sure if Mr. Holloway, um, I can't see him. I don't know if he's on, on, the, on the call, if he has a comment in regards to the, to the assessments or some of the challenges that maybe, um, or, or maybe just a comment on the discussion in regards to the assessments. But it does seem to be one of the most challenging things that has created this sort of frenzy. And the fact that, you know, we have what we have. We don't, yeah, we don't, um, we, I don't think we value exactly what we have and understand how that contributes to the value of the assessment. I'm just going to go, I do see uh, Derek Holloway on the call and he's unmuted. So Mr. Holloway, did you have any comments? <clears throat> Lisa, you're right. Uh, prices are crazy. I've been appraising real estate or I'm retired now, but since, uh, since 1980. And uh, I used to work at CMHC with a guy that built the first 12 and a half foot wide lots that were still on the record at Vancouver City. And he figured out a way to, to do that. City Council in Vancouver in the day really tried to stop them, but they did it. They had firewalls, fire separation, they had everything, and it was quite livable. But, you know, the, the I think uh, uh, Councillor Forbes touched on it. The, the big issue here, and uh, I am gonna read uh, Sam Cooper's book because uh, I'm sure it's gonna confirm my bias, but it, the bottom line is, is we're an international city and senior governments are trying to take some steps to mitigate uh, how many people can buy and, and whether foreigners can buy and uh, whether you can hide your money. The NDP is doing an excellent job as far as uh, at provincial level, as far as trying to get uh, uh, um, transparency on who's buying these properties, who's doing, uh, are they hiding money? All sorts of things. You, 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 they're, they're trying to identify a lot more than has ever been done in the past, but that's at a, at a higher level. At our level, um, Councillor, you know that I, like I've been in Deep Cove for 30 years. We bought here because it's what we could afford and it was cheaper way back then. And uh, the, 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 I'm surrounded by co-ops and nonprofits. They're relatively low density, um, one and two level, um, sorry, two and three level uh, stack townhouse and townhouse types of developments. My son went to school with all the kids from different income levels. We all had uh, a, a great neighborhood. Deep Cove is richer because of the, 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 the different income groups that live in the Cove. And uh, that's something that we need to figure out a way to get back to. And uh, myself and Ian Cullis and, and uh, 
uh, uh, I'm blanking now, but uh, we worked on goal number six and that we need to partner with BC Housing. When BC Housing came and talked to our group, they essentially said what uh, a board member from the from BC Housing they had lunch with about two weeks before that said, the district has to show up the land. Now, whether that is reflected in a higher density and you're giving some of that density to uh, uh, um, affordable housing or, or whether you're um, uh, dedicating some district land or rezoning some district land to, to have, uh, have a, a, an impact on being able to go to a proposal call for BC Housing. Hope, Ian, I'm not stealing your thunder because I noticed your hands up next. Um, but we need we need to um, uh, Michael Sadler as well. We need to start getting some of that provincial and federal assistance onto the North Shore, and you're going to have to fight the NIMBYs as council. I'm sorry, that's just the way it's got to be. Anyways, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I, I do have comments from Ian Cullis and Hessam Dahimi as well, so I'm going to go to them. Ian Cullis, hi. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to Eric, echo Derek's comments. Um, I think the nonprofit sector is one of your best partners. And I was thinking back to Councillor Bond's comments about rising rents. Yes, if you build market housing, they're going to charge the rents that the market will bear, which is as much as it can bear. The nonprofit sector will charge rents that are needed to maintain the building. So if you continue to build market rent, you're just building on affordable housing in a different way. So I think that's why you really do need to look at the nonprofit sector as a partner and an important partner at that. Because not only do they have land, they have money. They, the thing that they really struggle with is time. They don't have time. Their, their admin budgets are negligible. So when they need to go through council or through the development process that the city's put in place, it crushes them. So ultimately you're looking at, Councillor Bond, you mentioned how much does it cost to maintain these places? How much does it, are they gonna raise rents as the tenant turnover happens? Well, in the nonprofit sector, they don't raise rents when the tenant turnover happens. And they're looking at how can they bring money in to maintain the building without raising rent. So ultimately your best option is the community housing sector and looking at partnerships, looking at the church groups, looking at, ultimately we need land and then you need the partnerships. But in terms of partners, there's Metro Vancouver has money, FCM has money, CMHC has money, BC Housing has money. We need to get it here. Um, I would say my, my biggest concern um, and my biggest worry after spending two, over two years on this report is I'm worried that it's just gonna sit on a shelf. Um, so I think ultimately, yeah, that's, I, I think you need to look at those partnerships and if there's a lag time, the reality is, is that any building that's brought online, if it's proposed now, we can expect affordable housing in 10 years. So we need to hurry. Thank you very much for your comments. And before I go to Hassan Dahimi, you know, uh, there, there is another side of the equation that we haven't really been discussing, which is the capacity to build. And, and you know, the developers that I'm talking to are talking about shortages of staff, the inability to get sub-trades on to, um, to be able to work on the North Shore and, and other challenges like that. But at the same time, that same industry is also trying to get more and more projects lined up and lined up and lined up, despite the fact that there's significant shortages in the trades to be able to deliver on those projects, making for longer and longer timelines as well. SM Dahimi, you have some unique experience in dealing with this matter. I know you were going to make some comments. Wondering if you can also address the issues on construction and project delivery. And you're muted. SM, you're muted. You're pulled over. Listen, yeah. Here we go. Uh, I did pull over just to make sure that I uh, that I'm safe and I'm and, uh, fully present here. There, there are a couple of uh, points that I wanted to raise as uh, the, from uh, the discussion that we've been having. One of them is housing consumption. 
and the number of people per dwelling. From I studied the census from 2011, so compared 2006, 11, 2016, and and I don't remember the numbers exactly right now, but th the number of people per dwelling in our community is dropping quite significantly to a point where the, the significant amount of growth that you're we're seeing, and hopefully once we get the data from 2021 census, uh, we can actually be discussing this more factually, but the number of people per dwelling is dropping quite a bit. We have an aging population. Um, you know, when I, when we moved to the district of North Vancouver, there were six people in our household. Right now, the, our, our family household has one person, that's my mother living in the same house. Well, we moved a couple of times in the DNB, but um, so, uh, so the number of people and, and the growth that we need to, we need to have in, or, in order to accommodate that, you know, the, the, our, our, the, the changing consumption of housing, I think needs to be looked at closely. The other thing that I, that I wanted to talk and, and in line with uh, Mayor Little's comment, cost of construction is going up ridiculously high to a point where projects that we picked up a couple of years ago and, and we've retooled our business and we're, we're focused on purely building transit oriented purpose-built rental, partnering with various, you know, uh, other, you know, different municipalities, and, uh, and we're not doing any business in, in, in the DNV or on the North Shore for that matter. And, and a big chunk of it has to do with construction costs and trades. A lot of the times they don't even return your phone calls if they know that they have to cross, uh, cross a bunch of bridges uh, to get to work. And, uh, and they're busy enough in Fraser Valley or, or, or in, a, in other places where they don't have to face, uh, the commute and the ones that do end up uh, showing up um, are going to charge the premium for waiting in traffic. So that's 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 going to be a huge challenge, and that's one of the reasons that and and construction costs never go go down. Right now, like I said, you know we're we're seeing 15, 20 percent rise in construction costs. That puts a huge dent in other partners' budgeting. So and and we are dealing with senior le uh, senior levels of government that are going to be financially restrained as a result of everything that they had to deal with COVID. So if if you completely eliminate the market from it, do are we going to be able to accommodate that growth to begin with? Right now, you know the all the boogeymen were were out. You know international students. You know over the past couple years we, we haven't had it, uh, that much obviously for for obvious reasons immigration was basically at halt you know we, we weren't bringing in as, as as many people and we cramped down on, on money laundering and and as as much as possible and but we still have had a rise in rental rates and we've had a rise in 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 in, in market um one thing that we're not it's not part of the scope of our investigation it has to do with monetary policy and so on and so forth. But uh, we, 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 we have to be very mindful about our consumption, our housing, our changing housing needs, as well as how to deliver them, you know, be it with nonprofit partners or, or private developers. Th that's going to be a big challenge, how to deliver, actually deliver those housing units and get them to occupancy permits. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for your comments, Hassam, and uh, uh, and also for your, your service. Uh, I do have a couple of members here uh, from the public who have expressed an interest to contribute to the conversation. So I believe I have uh, Herman Ma followed by Peter Tieven. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Tieven, you, you had indicated earlier you wanted to speak. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Ma, if you want to come up to the speaker's desk there. And I'm able to give you about five minutes. Okay. While you're speaking, you can have your mask off. That's correct. Thank you. Your Worship and Council, my name is Herman Ma. I'm here to speak as a resident of the district, not for any association or place of work. Like everyone else, I want to commend the task force for that incredible job they did, especially over two long years. Um, there is a lot of valuable insight and actionable items in the report for Council and staff to digest. I just made note of a couple. 
I'm glad to see that the report speaks about expanding appropriate types of housing, uh, notwithstanding the tensions that uh, Councillor Bond mentioned. Uh, I do hope that the increase is consistent with the spirit of the OCP. I'm also glad to see that the recommendation about exploring rent to own models. I look at this opportunity through one of the two implementing lenses of the OCP, specifically social equity. Owning a home is a way to increase one's personal financial worth. If we only focus on rentals, some people won't be able to get ahead. I'm glad to see the emphasis on community building. We need affordable housing for people from all walks of life. I'm also glad to see that the report speaks about reviewing bylaws. I would like to see some more gentle densification, potentially through easing guidelines for coach houses, uh, relaxing setback requirements, and maybe allowing both a coach house and secondary suite on a property. This to me will reinforce community building. Finally, I'm glad to see that the report talks about working with partners, including other le levels of government, First Nations, developers, businesses, and nonprofit uh, groups. They're all part of the solution to build our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Teven, come on down. And yet, just to, to be clear about that, for the people that are in the council chambers, the public health order or the public expectations from the provincial government is that when you're seated and not participating in a meeting directly, uh, then you need to have your mask on. But if you're speaking, you are able to take your mask off while you're speaking. So welcome, whatever you choose. Thank you. Uh, what would uh, you guys feel com more comfortable with? Your comfort. Whatever you do. Yeah. Okay, if you have trouble hearing me, let me know. I'll take my mask off. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship, Council, uh, Peter Tivan, uh, also a, a citizen of the North Vancouver. I'm not affiliated with any, any organization. Um, most of you are aware uh, that this area is something where I've spent considerable volunteer hours. And some may be of the opinion that I have not much to contribute to this issue of rental and affordable housing. Some of you may be of the opinion but I do have something of value to say. Uh, I'll let others determine whether which one is true. Um, but I can tell you this. Uh, I tried writing three times numerous phone calls over a period of two years to try to appear before the Rental and Affordable Housing Task Force. It never happened. Um, you know, I, I take... Uh, uh, note of, of Mr. Crow's comments about it was hard to figure out who was in charge. Was it staff? Was it the chair of, of the task force? Was it council? Um, well, I, I think that the same thing came to bear. I encourage council to ask more questions and say how many, uh, you know, I, I think it's for you to determine Am I a member of the public on this matter? Am I a stakeholder? Um, you know, because I've, I, I started out just being interested in protecting a friend who's getting evicted. And I end up maybe doing more work than many people have done in this area. I don't know if that makes me a stakeholder or a member of the public. But I can tell you I never got the chance to say what I felt the task force needed to hear. Uh, the, the only, uh, information I received about that was that, uh, the people organizing it were keeping quote us so busy, we haven't had the time. Um, so I can tell you this through my research, I can explain to you why rents are higher in the market than they otherwise ought to be. I can explain to you why purpose-built rentals aren't getting built in numbers. I can explain to you why new small units get built and sell faster than other units. Uh, I can explain to you, uh, and, and here's the most important thing that I wanna convey. You have a set of recommendations and they're all good recommendations. Some of these recommendations I made to the previous council 
during the public hearing of Emory Village in 2018. Councilor Murray, you were there. Um, and, and, uh, but I encourage you to take these not as recommendations, but as requisites. One of the things that I asked and begged the previous council, I've also asked that of this council, is to define clearly here in the District of North Vancouver what your definition of affordable housing means, and then not let anyone use the term affordable housing in front of you unless they meet that definition. Um, uh, you know, as you, uh, this is a little bit of a segue into the coming special meeting. Again, same issue. Affordable is, uh, seems to be synonymous with non-market. I don't think that they're anywhere near the same thing. I have a definition to recommend. I wanted to give that to the committee, never got the chance. Uh, I stand ready to give it to any of you and explain my reasoning. In fact, I put it in my slides for this, the meeting coming up. I don't know how much time we'll get to spend on it, but please take it as requisite. You need a specific definition of affordable housing. And the minute somebody comes in front of you and misuses that, tell them to go away and learn what your definition is. Because if you remember back to, to Emory Village, first of all, I've watched that public hearing series multiple times. I don't think there was a single person asking that previous council to slow down that didn't say, go ahead and build it, but please, please build it at a time when there's somewhere for us to move to. No one, no one said don't build it. And there, I don't think that there was barely an advocate in favor of the proposal who didn't say the reason to approve it and evict 61 North Vancouver families was because it included so-called affordable units. And I think you all know I did about an 85 slide presentation disproving that very foundational argument that they were affordable. So uh, defining that is key. It's not a recommendation, it's a requirement. I don't see how you can get one positive step forward without solving it, solving that question, and I'm available to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tiemann. I, and I think in a lot of cases, though, it it's, tends to be the partner that defines affordable, and I agree that that's uh, challenging at times, but when the partner is BC Housing defining affordable, Metro Vancouver, federal government, uh, there are multiple definitions of affordability that we have to work through with the partner agencies. And since they tend to be paying bill, we have, we have to work with their definitions as well. Um, and uh, I think what we, we have found is that uh, uh, there are some fairly common definitions. What we've tried to push to is being, having it not based on a median income on the North Shore, which is the propensity for a lot of these organizations, but to have it be based closer to a median income for the entire Metro Vancouver. So the council has been pushing the matter uh, in, in that direction to try to make it uh, more of a broad, uh, uh, well, a harder target to hit to be able to call, a, call it affordable. Uh, but we don't always have uh, the, uh, um, the hammer when it comes to uh, how somebody else def decides to call affordable housing. We, we decide whether we accept it as that, but um, it's always a challenge and some of our partners uh, have, have their own uh, requirements. Uh, at this point now, we have about 10 minutes until we have to move to our special meeting. Uh, and, you know, I wanted to uh, conclude off with a, 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 just a, a, a broad straight statement of gratitude and appreciation. I was able to send out some, some uh, letters and notifications to the members of the committee uh, for their work, thanking them for their work. It, it's never going to convey it in the same warmth that we could in person. Uh, and I, I look forward to a time when we can uh, gather volunteers back together in our community and, and have some celebrations and recognize the enormous contributions that people have made uh, by volunteering their time and talents to address these important issues in our community. So uh, once again, on behalf of the council, I just wanted to express our deepest gratitude for the task force, for the dedicated volunteers, for the challenges that you overcame in order to be able to produce a top flight report that will be used for future decisions in the District of North Vancouver. Thank you very much.
Recommendation is on the floor. Moved by Councillor Muir. Is there a seconder on the matter? I'm happy to second the matter. Call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries. Thank you all so much for participating in the workshop. Uh, you have about a 10 minute uh, stand up and bio break and uh, before we get into the special meeting of council. I just want to check with the clerk. Is that a separate link to be in the special meeting? It is at the same link. And so if you'd like to stay through and, and uh, participate in our uh, special meeting, just stay on the call. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone.